Um, I got interested in uh, eccentric turning, looking at uh, Barbara Dill's work. And I don't know how many of you have seen this book, um, but she does a very good job of describing eccentric turning. And as a part of this, there were goblets that were included. Um, I'll see if I can find a quick example we can put up there. If I hold that still, what? And in looking through the book, there's one paragraph that it indicates that these goblets are three separate pieces, the bowl, the stem, and the base. And they were just mortise and tendon together, glued and then sanded. So it looked like a single piece. And I just kept thinking to myself, there must be a way of doing some of this without doing all of that work in making multiple pieces. And so I started thinking about how to deal with the axes um, what we're going to do today is called single point multi-axis turning. What is that? Whenever we put a piece of wood in the lathe, if I can get my fingers there, you're putting it between points in the center and you're creating a cylinder. You can do then parallel off axis by simply taking your points and moving them. I'll exaggerate. You'd never go this far and putting it up here. If you now spin this piece, this upper part is not going to be exposed to your tool, the lower part will, and you'll get an arc forming on one side. If you keep going, you'll ultimately get a circle about the size of a pencil, okay? So that's parallel turning. And then you can also do what she describes as off-axis turning, where we'll take this, and tilt it like this. Now you have to look at the, I'll try to keep my fingers straight. And you can now imagine that I'm taking the two corners off and you can create some wonderful forms in doing this. Well, as I started thinking through this, I was realizing all of her techniques require you to be between two points. And so how on earth can I make a single, um, piece of wood into a goblet because I've got to form the goblet aspect of it. And that's where we're gonna to get to a single axis. Only this axis is going to stay the same. And then we're going to change this in this direction without a tailstock on it. And I'll show you how to do that. What we end up with is something that looks like this. And and what I'm hoping you can see here is that the two aspects of the stem are not straight up and down. There's an angle. And depending on how much you offset it is going to give you the angles. Now, as I also go through this, I'm, I'll point out, I did this because kind of a test piece. Um, I learned a lot about uh, getting things that would look better. And this particular piece certainly does not look good. The bowl is way too small. The base is way too thick. Uh, the base is also too small for the size of the stem. But what this does show with the length of this right here, it gives you an idea of the angle that's there. And so we'll start looking at some of the angles on a smaller piece. One of the reasons I like this there's tremendous opportunity here for asymmetry. <clears throat> and I like asymmetry in art, and most of what we do is symmetrical. So trying to find something that becomes asymmetric and to play with, to me, is a lot of fun. This is essentially what I start out with. Um, this was a cherry tree that I, somebody in the club had a friend that we knocked down 17 trees in his yard. I can't remember who that was. Uh, I went over and grabbed some of the cherry. Uh, this particular piece that I have on the lathe is from my own front yard, a uh, cedar tree that died, and it kind of hung out there for uh, about a year and a half, two years, so it was pretty dry. Um, I've brought several of these because there are some unknown factors. If you focus in real tight here, Jerry, you can see the cracks. Now, these cracks have all been filled with CA glue, so they've all been stabilized. 
But what I've learned about this is that I'm gonna cut off about the top half inch right at the beginning and just make sure that there are no more cracks down below. Some of these take quite a while because as I find cracks, I take it off the lathe, set it aside. I fill it with CA glue. Sometimes if it's a big one with coffee grounds. Um, I have used epoxy in the past on some of these pieces, but I really don't want to be doing the eccentric part of the turning if I've got a piece that has cracks going through it. I want them pretty solid. So this has been sealed and all of these cracks that you see in your solid uh, if we have this piece of cherry is pretty solid that could be used. What I'm going to try to make today is something very similar to this to show you. This is about six inches high, and I've tried to make pieces in uh, six, seven and a half inches, and nine inches. The nine inch ones tend not to look very good. They're, they're just too tall. Uh, the one thing that I have made that looks a little better is if you want to make a champagne flute. Uh, that tends to look better in that size, but the six and the seven and a half inch. Notice on this one how much shorter the stem is, so you don't quite see that straight line that you did on the taller piece. This one is seven and a half inches, and I think the proportions and sizes are certainly a lot better, and you can again really see the asymmetry in this. If you look straight at this, when I turn it in this direction, notice that the stem goes straight up and down. You can't see any offset. It looks like it's perfect. Whereas I turn it 90 degrees, you see this. If I show you this one, when I turn the upper stem, so it's directly underneath the goblet, notice the bottom one doesn't line up, all right? This is a 90 degree offset. The one that was straight up and down is 180 degree offset. And you could do 90, 180, and 270. 270 is just a minus 90. This is my first time on this lathe. And I wanted to uh, thank Ken for getting, getting a lathe for the club. That was my height. I always tell the story. I appreciate uh, John Armstrong. When I took his class, I remember the first morning when I got to class, John said, all right, lathes are first come, first serve. You just get the one that you walk up to, except that one over there. That's Bruce's. <laughs> and he had raised it up for me. So the first thing I'm going to do is just... Um, cut off this top part and let's make sure our wood is good. Yeah, and these, all of these cracks, it's sealed all the way down. So I feel pretty comfortable that I can go ahead and proceed with this piece of wood without any problems. The first thing that I started playing with are proportions. And what I've kind of learned about this is that it tends to look best if the bowl is about one third of the uh, distance. It's just a little off of the golden ratio, you know, 2.6, um, where I have shortened that sometimes thinking it might look better, it doesn't. So right at about one third is just perfect. And the bottom part, there's gonna be a little bit, probably about a quarter to three eighths of an inch, which is gonna be our base. So the first thing I'm gonna do is start just forming a bowl. And I want to get the outsides of the bowl done. And I've kind of learned that the bowl needs to be just a little bit smaller than the base that's ultimately made. So I'll take this down just a little bit more than the base of the uh, spindle. And you can see my pencil line on there. So I try to come up to that and Leave that intact. Once I get to this point, that's gonna be basically my bowl. And ultimately I'm gonna to have to take this point right here down to a level that's gonna be the stem. But if I do that too early, then I create a lot of instability that I really can't make the inside of the bowl. So I know that this is where my bowl is going to end. I'm going to, now going to just take down some of this. is just all waste wood. One of the things that I found interesting about doing this is it's a, it's a nice opportunity to use branches that we otherwise you know, don't have a lot of use for. So anything that's about a two and a half to three inch branch where you can get a cylinder out of it works really well. And you're really working within the pith of the branch. 
And as you can see right here, what's happening is all the colors are coming out. And it just, this cedar just makes a beautiful little goblet, just enhancing all the colors. Now, normally what I would do at this point is I would spend a fair amount of time really smoothing and sanding this down because I want this to be finished. Once we get to the point of doing the eccentric turning, getting back onto this original access is pretty much impossible. It'll be close, but it's pretty much impossible to get it to a level that you really want. I tried working the bowls um, with a variety of different gouges. And I found what happened to it was it put a lot of stress on the piece itself. And so I was really concerned about it uh, coming apart. And so I started just using Forstner bits. Most of these bowls I find are just exactly the length of the Forstner bit before you put it in. I just always check that and that'll be a perfect depth. And I've also learned just for the stress that's put on uh, this wood, because a lot of stuff, again, I'm having to seal cracks. Um, I start with a small bit and work my way up. And I go up in sizes about a quarter inch each time. The final bit, I kind of want the outer rim right here on the edge to be about three eighths of an inch. And that might be just the tiniest bit thick, but I could take that down with the Uh, on the lathe. Um, I started using this hollowing tool, obviously meant for much larger pieces, just because the small diameter of the cutting tool seems to work for this. And where it kind of came in handy, believe it or not, was making this champagne flute. This particular tool was just an ideal size that would fit all the way down into the bottom. And again, I have something to demonstrate about this when I'll pass it around here in a few minutes, but I wanna show you something about axes. Now what I'm feeling are the ridges from the Forstner bits. So I'll just take those down. We just got one ridge left to go from that original smallest bit. Bruce, it looks like we have a question from John. Yeah, John. I noticed you were one of my better students. <laughs> the tool that he is using, which is what, easy? Uh, easy tool, easy wood tool. They tell you to use it flat. He reduced the vibration of the tool, if you notice, by putting the tip of it in a slight negative rate. He dropped that down. If you can see a shadow between the tool yeah. rest and the bar itself, that lifted up. There was a shadow there, some of the vibration reduced, and he got a cleaner cut, as opposed to just going in flat and whacking at it. Uh, that, that's a really good point, and uh, I learned that lesson the hard way. <laughs> we won't talk about what the hard way meant. But, but absolutely, keeping it in a downward position and just putting it slightly into a negative rake makes a huge difference, and I try to avoid as much vibration as I can. One of the things that occasionally happens with this is the vibrations will cause a little bit of a, a movement here at the chuck, even though it's tight. And suddenly your external part is a tiny bit off axis. I don't care, okay? And I just leave that alone. I do not try to bring that back into true 
I'll bring it back into true on the inside. Um, because as we get into the eccentric portion, it isn't going to matter at all. Um, the other thing I find with the Forstner bits is, you know, they always have that Brad point, you know, and what do you do with it? And, man, I have fought and fought and fought with that. Sometimes I can take it down with this. The other trick I've found is to take um, a three eighths or half inch regular drill bit and just very gently touch it into the bottom of that and then come back with this tool and I can clean that up real nicely. But boy, it's a pain to try to get down into that. Has anybody ever tried that? Gary, I see you nodding your head. Have you ever? Uh, I think that's a good tip. I've not tried it, but I have to. Yeah, just touching it with that a little bit. It does, you, you want your lathe speed to be a little higher than you normally would with drilling because you're really doing a smoothing cut with the drill. So instead of at 400, I'd have it maybe up at 1,000 and you're just going in about what, an eighth of an inch, three sixteenths of an inch is all. I'm gonna do just a little more because the bottom is still kind of rough. And this cedar is fairly soft, so I can also clean up a lot of that at the very bottom uh, with poor sandpaper. I have tried using a straight carbide cutter. Probably as you can see the size of that carbide cutter, um, the arc down here at the bottom is um, enough that it catches a lot of the blade. And uh, I stopped using this because I'm getting a lot of catches. I'm trying to look for the, I'm just gonna use this to clean up the outside just a little bit. Now I'm just gonna prep the bottom of the bowl, get it ready so that we can go into the off axis. Since we've done most of this, most of the rotational energy is going to be from this point down, I don't worry about reducing the size of this and I want to take it down about to where I'm going to be ultimately with the stem. I want a relatively sharp demarcation line here. Can you see the black line? We'll go ahead and burn a line in there. Uh, it helps for a couple of things. First, it's a nice demarcation point as you continue to cut on the lathe. But the other aspect, when I pass this one around in a few minutes, when you sit here and hold this, the burn line at the top and the bottom, which marks the stem, should not be parallel, okay? And that off parallel aspect, that asymmetric aspect, helps to enhance what the look of this is. I'm always worried that when I do this, I'm gonna pull it right off the lathe. I have not to date done that. And so I get just kind of a nice fine line and that's gonna help me a lot with what the next step is. So here's where we're gonna to go to the eccentric part. And the way that I figured out to do this is that I always start with number one on my Nova chuck. I don't want this to slip inside the chuck. So I'm gonna hold it up against it. <clears throat> and as I loosen it, I'm tipping it straight down away from the number one. I ultimately want to get about an eighth of an inch gap. And I'm looking at both number three, two and number four here to make sure that my gap on each side is the same so that it comes right at one. By doing that, when I go to the next offset, I can make sure it's roughly about either 90 or 180 degrees off. This tenon is probably three. And I do, by the way, look down here to make sure that the chuck is grabbing onto wood. And I want a nice tight fit in my perfect world. If I can create an indentation on the wood is good. As I go through each of these steps, this would be completely sanded. The interior here would be completely sanded and ready for finishing. But you know how it is. You come back later and it's not exactly what you wanted you should be able to go back to the axes, all three of the different axes that you need, at least for the purposes of sanding. You can't cut it again, but at least for sanding. If you're trying to do something like this and sand, obviously you're bouncing all over. So my goal right now is to work on this middle third. And I've got my pencil line here that ultimately is gonna go away, but I need to knock down a lot of this wood. And I know people have different terms for it when you, Turn this on and start seeing it. We'll start real low. I call it ghost. So as I increase the speed, 
you can see part of the wood where you're seeing through it down to the lathe that there's not solid wood there. And I call that ghost. And so that's why I'm going to start working on cutting away and ultimately getting from a arc down to a um, circle. And I'm up around 900 now. And I found personally the best way for me to do this is I'm looking at the upper side of this, not the lower side, to see how much wood I'm taking off. Right now, we'll just come right up to that pencil line. Now I'm trying to go right at that burn mark that we've seen and trying to run uphill with the wood so I avoid splits. But I've gotten down far enough that when I'm sitting here with my bevel, I can feel the bevel hitting the bowl. And you can start seeing we're already getting a symmetry in the cut. As you keep working through this, what you get right here is a formation of a starting a little bit of a disc. And the disc is always going to form uh, just because of the nature of the angle that you're, you're cutting on it. And so if you can see right up in here, that cut's coming right up against that black line. So if I keep moving towards the bowl, I'm going to lose my accent line, which sometimes I do right along this edge. I want to keep the rest of it. So let's take it down to the stem a little bit more. And I am going to take the speed up a little bit. We're at 1,200 now. And you can see the disc is forming more. One of the problems you run into all the time is right here on the edge. It's hard to see. I don't know if you can see it there. I'm getting a little bit of chip out right on the edge of my disc. And so that's just a matter of sharpness and speed uh, to be able to just slowly take it down. Most of the time you can get these discs very smooth when I chip out. Here's a secret. I wouldn't worry about it excessively because at the end, you can take a piece of sandpaper and sand this down flat or possibly parallel to the line that's here. And it just looks like more of the eccentric wood. Okay, once, once that disappears, you don't notice that you've taken it out. You've just enhanced the appearance of it. I've always been curious as to how far down you can go with these stems on straight goblets that I've done. You can go down pretty small, 3 16 of an inch, but it makes me nervous with this eccentric spinning of the stress that's being applied there. And obviously you can do any kind of embellishments you want. You can do beads, coves in here to enhance it. I think uh, because I use a lot of highly grained wood, uh, I think it takes away from the, the graining aspect of it. So I don't put a lot of beads or coves in it. When I use something like I've learned, here's a little piece of poplar. It doesn't have much excitement to it. There's not a whole lot of graining to it. And here I would probably spend more time and put in those kinds of embellishment. The next thing that we're gonna go to, well, actually I'm gonna take this down just a tiniest bit more on this end. And I'm just gonna make a mark here that I'm gonna take out in a minute. That mark right there is about our separation between the upper and the lower parts. I can narrow that part of the stem down in the next step. So I'm gonna go back to these for just a moment. We're about to go to the second axis. So this is what I showed you before, that when I look at it straight on, it looks like it's perfectly vertical. And here you can see the offset. So on this one, I did 180 degree offset. So that's number on the Novichok number one and number three. This is the one that I showed you that when the stem is perfectly aligned with the bowl, the bottom part is not. This is a 90 degree offset. So here I use the number two setting instead of going all the way to number three at 180 degrees. And one of the reasons this is important is you can ultimately do this. Now the upper one is in alignment and the lower three, as I rotate it, you see that there's no parallel aspect to it at all. So here's one, two, three, four, done on each different number on the Novichuk. You can do eight, and if you look in Barbara Dill's book, she has somewhere it looks like she does 12 and creates a spiral coming down through it. The nice part of this one is that <clears throat> as you hold it in your hand and look at it, there's really nothing that's parallel. If you look closely, even at the two burn lines on the top and the bottom, you're gonna find they're not parallel either. Now I've got number three sitting up here. Number one's on the bottom, which is already being separated. So just holding it, I'll loosen it up. And that's seated it back into number one. 
And I'll do the same thing on number three. It kind of goes without saying that the more you tilt it, you have a longer tenon, the more offset you're gonna get in terms of angles. But I do urge you to be careful as you go out to nine inches, uh, creating a bigger gap than an eighth of an inch. You've got obviously a lot of variability out here that you're hitting. And again, I get concerned about the stability. So I'm gonna do the lower part and try to create that. This is going to be a 90 degree, I'm sorry, 180 degree offset because I went to number three. So the two axes are gonna be opposite each other. We've gotta to remember to leave enough for a base. And not only do I want a base, I want a decoration. And I found if I could put another burn line in, it really enhances it. So I just wanna leave that here down at the bottom. And I'm right up around a thousand. You can see, let's see, uh, it's hard to see on the TV screen, but when you look down through the center here, the axis is off enough that there, the wood disappears in the center. It's all ghost wood. Well, you can watch that while you're doing this. And as long as I keep my chisel into what appears to be solid wood, I'm not gonna break it apart. But obviously if you went all the way up to the ghost wood, the bowl just falls off. Now we're getting the development of our mid disc. Okay, and this again is just going to be created by the angles. The disc is gonna be part of it. Um, if you look at the tall one that I sent around, whoever's got the tall one, the disc in the center is fairly prominent. And I wasn't quite sure that I really liked that. Uh, I forgot to mention though, if you will hold that like a champagne flute, everybody here in the room should be able to find a position on your hand where you go, how did he know to fit that just to me? It's an amazingly comfortable grip, but you've got to rotate it and find your grip. So the size of your length of your fingers doesn't matter. You're going to find a comfortable grip somewhere on that. But you've got to adjust these disc sizes so they look proportional. This is clearly not uh, something that looks very attractive. And I found a nice little defect in the wood. This does not appear to go all the way down in it. So I'm going to keep going. So when I'm looking at the ghost wood, there's a little point right there. And I've got to be just to the upside, the bowl side of that point to be able to take this down lower. That was 1100. Yeah, um, I've rarely ever gone above 1200, um, depending upon your wood. I had a, I decided to try this with some sycamore at home. I had a sycamore tree that branches fell and they were the perfect size. Uh, my recommendation is don't try this with sycamore. So this is on an Axminster chuck. This is eccentric turning as well, but you're on a single axis that's offset. It's almost as if you're doing two point turning that's in parallel. It's what the Axminster gives you. You can very quickly see when I pass this around, you can mostly look at the chuck to see what the chuck is about but you can see why sycamore doesn't work very well here. For those who have not seen it, the Axminster chuck simply fits on a Nova chuck. You tighten it down. And then on the back, you can adjust this for an offset of whatever you want to be able to turn it. Okay, so I'm gonna keep working on taking this disc down further in size, which means I have to go up towards the bowl. And just with it spinning, you can kind of get an idea that the lower part of this is still shorter than the upper part. So I want to move in that direction. And I'm just slowly taking down that disc size. And the disc is still bigger than I want. So it's coming down in size. I've got a groove on this side of it. And it makes you want to think, well, I don't like that groove. I'm going to take it down. So I'm going to take it this way and cut in. Right, <laughs> exactly. You can see Gary's vigorous head shake. It does not work. You'd have to go back to the other axis if you want to fix this side. So don't even try to touch that. I'm going to take more of this off so it'll probably go away. I was also going to point out, you can create additional decorations here by just creating a little bit of a cove on this side if you wanted to. So I'm getting closer to that groove that's in there. Um, this isn't bad. The lower part is still a little bit bigger than the uh, upper part. So I want the stems to be pretty much the same size.
And now the disc size is starting to at least enhance the appearance of the bowl. So that's not a bad disc size. And the good news here is that I've gone far enough that I don't have any chip out on this. So uh, what we used to say professionally was the enemy of good is better. So I like this disc size and I'm not gonna fool around with a lot more. I've got some ridging up here. I would have just taken this out with sandpaper, okay? Um, trying to adjust these. If I keep going with my tool, I'm going to be adjusting the size and run into structural problems. And I'm just gonna clean up this bottom just a little bit. Because I put enough tension on this when I was up at number one, I'm hoping it will lock into the same groove. And you can see that that upper portion is not really spinning true. But since this is a demo, I'll see if I can clean up a little bit of. So I still have a fair amount of a defect here. And that defect doesn't bother me at all. Because I'll tell you what, I can take sandpaper, sand that flat, and you're going to think it's just part of the turning. You wouldn't have a clue. So don't try to sand that with the curve. Sand it. You can kind of see where the defect flattens out right, right there. If I can um, sand that flat right there, it's going to really enhance what the appearance is. It's not going to look bad at all. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to do the base. So for the base, I've gone back to the original axis. The first thing I'd ask you to look at is look at the bowl. Okay, so I'm pretty close to what the original axis is. It's off just a, just the tiniest bit, okay, that's there. But it tells me that my base is now in a parallel axis to the top part. And I can spin it a little faster. We'll go up to 1200. Notice I'm not getting any chatter because it's the original axis of how the wood was put on the lathe. The other trick I've discovered is that you wanna spend as much time in the base as the bowl. If you get a fat base with a really nice looking bowl, it just looks terrible on the whole thing. So you really gotta to try to get them to be sized. But I also wanna put a little bit of a decoration down here so I can put a burn mark that will enhance the upper burn mark. And by the way, this move right here, what we're doing, you could have done it while it was on the second axis. And that just enhances it. If you look at the small ones there, you'll see that the stem is coming out at an angle from that. Here, the stem will be coming out pretty much from the center. And that's still a little fat. What I'm trying to do is put a, uh, this would be a concave curve on this bottom part. Uh, to, if you do a convex curve, it won't look real good. All, look at wine glasses. They're almost all a concave curve on the uh, bottom. And I've left a secondary, uh, just kind of a decorative mark there, just to show you, you can play with anything that you want. Let's put a burn mark on the lower part. This is a little rough here. And again, we'll have to come out with sanding. A lot of the sanding that I do on these is hand sanding. It's not on the lathe at all. And just usually working it with 240, this will work down pretty quickly and really smooth out. And I usually go up to around uh, uh, 320, occasionally 400, just so I get a uh, nicer finish on it. I finish these at this point completely. I leave it on the chuck so that I would then have a... Um, uh, finished piece. I generally use sanding lacquer on these and then just kind of buff them and polish them. Uh, depending upon the graining, I may put a spray lacquer on top of it or occasionally just a wax above that. Uh, this particular one and the ones that you've been holding have only been finished with a uh, sanding lacquer. Okay. And then, and then polished. I buy deft. It's actually deft sanding lacquer. It has, I believe, a nitrocellulose in the lacquer. I got it. Each step is sanded. So as soon as the bowl is finished, well, actually, as soon as I've shaped the bowl, I generally will completely sand that. Then I go in and do my inside, completely sand that. And then each step, because once I do, once I've set this axis, getting back to it perfectly is hard. So I will sand on the lathe as I go then do the bottom one in the final. 
And then I pull it off, leaving it on the chuck, pull it off the lathe, and I'll sit there and hand sand it on the work. You know, if you decide to do something like this, um, my suggestion is just get a solid piece of wood that's not going to come apart. You can put all the glue in it if you want. Um, and just start playing with it. Because one of the things I found the most difficult, believe it or not, was those discs, making sense of them in my head. Well, now I get it. Um, and after you've done a couple of these, they will just automatically make sense to you as to how you cut those discs. Let me do just one other step. I'm just gonna, this is the, a piece that I done at home and I brought in. I'm gonna leave that piece we did today attached uh, because I'll just go home and finish it. I think that there's some things I can do to correct that uh, chip out. Um, this is how I cut them off. Um, when I cut these off, I wanna make sure that I'm incanted. Um, the very first one I made, I, I was, well, actually it was in John's class. We had to make a goblet. And I thought it turned out really nice. I was shocked at how nice one of my first pieces was. And then I cut it off straight on the bottom and totally ruined it. It just was absolutely awful. So these are cut in and I try to cut them. I didn't take quite enough of the top out on this one, but I try to kind of make them roughly parallel. And obviously I would prefer not hitting the metal. So I've got to create enough room to get And so the depth of that little plug is about how far it is off of parallel from the base. And then these will all really set fairly true. This is stainless steel, it's just smooth stainless steel. This is commercial burn wire. It certainly brings the eye down to the base more. Um, also, when you try this the first time, I'd really encourage you try more, even more than two axes. Uh, because with the no, any chuck that's marked one, two, three, and four, it's so easy to align them, you know, to go back and forth. And just those final cuts on the disc, uh, maybe it's a good thing that uh, we had the accident and it chipped it apart. You, you can see what went from beautiful to pretty tough. You can create that the center disc, which is the axis change, just above it or below it, you can create a spot for a burn mark. So obviously you cannot do a burn mark on the disc itself. And if you look at these where the burn mark is up above, you'll see that I've taken wood away right up to the burn mark. Sometimes I've taken out a little of the burn mark. Um, it's pretty tough to redo that burn mark if you've got a gap because it can slide off on you. So you know, I urge caution if you have, have removed part of it. Um, I'm not so sure I'd be excited about trying to put that wire on the high-speed spin again. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention. I hope this is Thank you very much, Bruce.